What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. It has been a long time since I actually created content for the channel. It may be only a few weeks for you, but it's been about a month and a half for me. So I'm really excited to get back in the swing of things with today's brew, which is a Raspberry Berliner Weiss. Now, if you have watched the channel for a few weeks, you'll probably recognize this as the Margarita Lime Goza that I made not too long ago with Philly Sour Yeast, which is another great way to make a sour beer. But today we're gonna be stepping the complexity up a notch by using a uh, kettle souring method. That's a more complicated method of making a sour beer than just using Philly sour yeast, but it also lends a more complex sourness and a more uh, interesting flavor to the actual beer itself. So instead of using Philly sour yeast, which is just a yeast really that ferments uh, and produces ethanol as well as lactic acid uh, for that souring effect, today we're gonna be doing the kettle sour method, which involves actually pitching in lactobacillus and creating a lot more complexity in the sourness, a lot of different flavors that you would not get from just simply adding lactic acid to a fermentation like you would with Philly sour. So I'm very interested to see what happens. This is the first time I have ever done a kettle sour too so it should be really fun this is kind of one of those beers that i've been meaning to do for a couple of years and just never got around to um, and i finally got the ingredients finally got the uh, set of balls all put together and a good reason to do it in that i've really kind of had this rediscovered enjoyment of of sour beers uh, so i'm really excited to get into this let's stop babbling and get going with this video before we jump into the recipe though, I would like to thank both Northern Brewer and Claw Hammer Supply for their support of the channel. So Northern Brewer uh, got all the ingredients from them. They're a great place to shop for ingredients. I'd recommend you check them out. As well as Claw Hammer Supply, they manufacture the system that I've been brewing on today. We'll be using the 10 gallon, 240 volt brewing system. And it is a electric system that can hold a very specific temperature for a long time. So that's absolutely perfect for kettle souring. I also wanna give another shout out to another supporter of today's video, Matt. Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is a cereal company that aims to provide high protein and wholesome benefits in a breakfast cereal while still reminding you of what it used to be like as a kid when you ate those nice sugary delicious cereals. Magic Spoon has 13 to 14 grams of protein, 4 to 5 grams of net carbs, and 0 grams of sugar. It's also keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free and naturally flavored. This variety pack here comes in four delicious flavors, which include fruity, frosted, cocoa, and my favorite, peanut butter. Let me tell you, it tastes delicious and it really brings back some memories. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on screen and use the code APTBREW for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash APTBREW to save $5 today. And thanks again to Magic Spoon for helping sponsor this video. So Berliner Weiss is a really simple beer. Um, it's a very low alcohol beer. Most examples are less than 4% alcohol. So the grain bill is really, really small. Again, very similar to this Goza, it's a part barley malt, part wheat malt beer. So we're gonna go with another 50-50 blend on this one and use three pounds each of RAR premium pills and RAR white wheat malts. Um, this should get us an ABV of about 3% for the hops in this one, um, Berliner Weiss has an insanely low level of IBUs. If you brew it with a traditional method, instead of using the kettle souring process, um, you actually have to add such a low level of IBUs because you don't want to inhibit the growth of the lactobacillus, which is gonna sour the beer. So with a kettle souring process, we can kind of get around that, um, but I'm still staying true to the style and only adding about four IBUs worth of Hallertal Mittelfroh, which is about half an ounce going in at 15 minutes. And a good reminder, and that's 15 minutes is the length of the entire boil. Uh, once we finish our kettle souring process and boil it and put it into the fermenter, all we're gonna do is 15 minutes worth of work on that. For the water on this one, we are gonna be using a relatively light and balanced profile, similar to what I used for this Goza. So that water profile is uh, 48 parts per million of calcium, four parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 55 parts per million of chloride and 57 parts per million of sulfate with no bicarbonates in there at all. Now the zeros in this are not true zeros, they're probably about five parts per million uh, based on the fact that this is spring water. Uh, but the spring water I'm using is actually only about five to 10 parts per million of the relatively important brewing minerals. When you're building a water profile up to something over 40 or 50 parts per million of some minerals, it doesn't really matter in the end of the day if you're using spring water versus RO or distilled. To get this water 
profile, I'll be adding two grams of gypsum, one gram of Epsom, and three grams of calcium chloride to seven gallons of spring water. I'm using seven gallons because we are only boiling for 15 minutes, therefore I'm not gonna have as high of a boil off uh, amount as I would for a traditional 60 minute boil. Technically, this should go somewhere under the fermentables, but it's really just what adds the fruit flavor to this particular beer. We're gonna be using uh, three pounds of crushed raspberries in secondary to give a red color, hopefully, and a really nice raspberry flavor and tartness to this beer. This is a really easy way to add fruit flavor to a beer, and it will, keep in mind, ferment out all of the sugar in that fruit, so you're gonna be left with a tart flavor, not with a sweet flavor. Um, but this is really just all natural and the easiest way to do it. So I went and I bought three pounds of raspberries at my local grocery store, threw them all in the freezer, and then uh, basically when it comes time to condition them, I'll take them out of the freezer. That thaw, freeze, thaw process will destroy the cell walls in the fruit and actually break them down and make it much, much easier for the yeast to get in there and ferment those uh, sugars and to get that like extra color and flavor to come out. So basically I'm going to add those into my fermentation as soon as the uh, initial primary fermentation is stopped. This will have a little bit of active yeast left over in the actual fermentation. They'll start over again and they'll ferment down a little bit further probably with the addition of these raspberries. For the yeast in this beer, um, I'm gonna kind of loop the, uh, the lacto contribution under that. So uh, the primary yeast for the fermentation of the wort, the production of ethanol is gonna be USO5. But before we actually pitch our USO5, we are going to be doing that kettle souring process, dropping the pH in the wort down to about 3.2. And in order to do that, we need some sort of lactobacillus. And the best way to get lactobacillus, if you don't wanna order it from the brewing stores, um, is to just go to uh, usually like your local health food place or probiotic place and get a one liter carton of Good Belly. Flavor doesn't matter, the flavor is gonna ferment out, um, but the Good Belly, especially that one liter carton, has something like 20 billion cells of active living Lactobacillus plantarum, which is the strain that we're gonna be using today. This is gonna help drop the pH of the wort and give you that sourness. This is an absolutely critical part of brewing a kettle sour. Now, of course, you could use a bacterial blend from your favorite yeast manufacturer. Um, they all carry something of the sort, some sort of bugs, um, but this is really just the cheapest and easiest way to do it. And once again, that flavor really ferments out, so there's no real need to purchase a specific flavor if you can't find the right one. And lastly, for the mash on this one, we're gonna be mashing this one at 148 Fahrenheit for about 90 minutes. This is a nice low, uh, high attenuation focused mash temperature. We want this to be a very light bodied and very dry finishing beer. So uh, Berliner Weiss used to be known as the champagne of Berlin. Uh, so basically we wanna get this down to that very brute level, uh, ideally. So uh, basically keeping that mash temperature nice and low, letting it rest for a long time ensures we get really complete conversion and we get a nice dry beer at the end of the process. Let's go ahead and jump into the actual brew day footage. I started out by adding seven gallons of spring water into my 10 gallon, 240 volt claw hammer supply system while I milled out my six pounds of grain overall. I did make sure that the gap in the mill was set properly for that wheat malt as well. At this time, I also measured out my water salts and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. Once I reached my target mash temperature of 148 Fahrenheit, I doughed in with my entire grain bill and broke up any clumps that were encountered in the process. Once the mash had uh, gone on for about 90 minutes, I raised it up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. Uh, this just aids in the watering process and especially helpful when you're using that wheat malt. Once that 15 minute mash out was done, I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for another 15 minutes. As that basket was draining, I started to add lactic acid to the wort to start bringing it down to that target pH of 4.5 prior to adding my lactobacillus. It only took about six milliliters of lactic acid to actually bring the whole thing down and I actually ended up going slightly under my target of 4.5, uh, but that's not a big deal. I went up to a short boil. I only boiled long enough to ensure that my wort was sanitary and to observe a good hot break in the process. And then once that had finished, I chilled it down to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And at this point, I set my controller to maintain 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I added in my one liter carton of Good Belly. Mm -hmm. 
At this point, I added some CO2 into the headspace of the kettle, and I wrapped everything up in plastic wrap uh, to ensure that it was airtight. And just to be extra sure, I also taped the outside of the kettle rim with some duct tape. I let the wort sit with lactobacillus in it and gradually begin to sour. I took regular pH measurements about every 12 hours and I found that actually only 36 hours later I had reached uh, a below target level of about 3.15 for my actual final wort pH. This is a little more sour than I intended. I was hoping for 3.2, but 3.15 is not that far off. At this point, I didn't want to risk the uh, wort getting any more sour, so I stopped the kettle souring process and I continued the brewing process uh, to get it into the fermenter a short while later. So all I did here was unwrap everything in the kettle and bring everything up to a boil. I hit that boil and I held the boil for about 15 minutes, adding in my half an ounce of Hallowtown Mittelfrua at 15 minutes for the four IBUs required. I also threw in a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient in about 10 minutes, uh, just as usual. I wanna keep the yeast nutrient in here, especially because this wort is pretty acidic. Once the 15 minute boil was complete, I rapidly chilled down uh, to about 70 or 80 Fahrenheit, which is as cold as I can get at this time of year, and put it in my anvil bucket fermenter. I used my fermentation fridge to chill it down further to about 68 Fahrenheit over the next couple hours and added in my two packets of USO5 and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, um, I'm really gonna just focus on how to make kettle sours, not necessarily how to make sour beers. So I've kind of already touched on that slightly when I talked about it in my Goza video. So if you want a little bit more detail, please go check that video out. Um, but otherwise, I'm gonna talk more about what your options are for making kettle sours. So the fermentation process in a kettle sour is twofold. First of all, you have your souring agent in your bacterial pitch. And secondly, you have your actual fermenting yeast addition. It depends on what kind of beer you're making. This is a Berliner Weiss, so I'll try to keep it along the lines of a Berliner Weiss. Uh, for the actual souring agent, I'll be using the Good Belly, which is Lactobacillus plantarum, but there's also plenty of other great lacto strains out there. Good Belly is simply the cheapest and easiest to find option as far as a commercial lacto source. Um, from what I've read in the research that I've done, uh, it seems that not all probiotics out there, even the ones that say they have live cultures in them, are what you wanna to use to make a kettle sour. You can have mixed results with them. Uh, so I just recommend doing your own research to make sure you know what you're gonna be picking up as far as a bacterial blend, uh, if you're just going to your grocery store to find it. There are plenty of other options though, and one way to inoculate is actually to pitch in a handful of acidulated malt. So some maltsters, uh, I know Best Malts does this, and I know, uh, uh, Vireman does this as well. With their acidulated malt, there's actually a layer of lactobacillus on the outside of the malt, which gives it that acidic character. Um, you could just pitch that directly into your wort and you should actually get a good, healthy uh, culture of lacto going. I've never personally tried that, but it's come recommended to me from Genus Brewing uh, and they know what they're talking about. Secondly, I'd also recommend checking out a uh, blend of cultures that you can get from a yeast manufacturer. With these blends, you're not gonna get just lactobacillus, but you might also get some and Pediococcus and other bacterial strains that are beneficial for brewing. As far as the actual brewer's yeast contribution itself, first of all, I wanna make a note. You wanna make sure you're at least double pitching what you would normally pitch for a standard batch at your recommended gravity. The reason for this is that it's really hard for brewer's yeast to ferment uh, down in that low threes uh, pH range. That's definitely not easy for them. It can be done, but they will tend to crap out a little early um, and they could use a little extra help. So I recommend adding in some yeast nutrient. I recommend adding in plenty of oxygen into your wort and making sure that you pitch tons of yeast. Uh, so that's why I'm gonna be adding the two packets of USO5 that I'm using. But as far as the strain choice, um, really you can go with any solid 
brewer's yeast strain that is nice and clean. Uh, so for a Berliner Weiss, despite it having Weiss in the name, you're not actually making a Weiss beer, so you don't need to use Weiss beer yeast. You really just need to use something clean and simple, um, because otherwise you're gonna get a lot of competing flavors in there. You're gonna get uh, yeast characteristics that compete with the sour character, as well as the fruit addition that you're adding in. That's, that's not traditional, of course, but it's something that I wanted to do, and I don't want things to compete with that. The easiest way to do this is uh, really just to use a clean fermenting ale yeast like USO5 or the Chico strain. Of course, though, if you want to stay continentally uh, focused, you can use something like the German ale strain, a Kolsch strain, an Altbier strain. Um, all of those things work really pretty well. At the end of the day, you just want something clean. Pick your favorite clean yeast, throw it in, and just make sure you take care of it. So just to recap, I'll be using Lactobacillus plantarum in the form of good belly to sour the wort, and that'll be at about 100 Fahrenheit, uh, probably for about two to three days. And then I'll be fermenting it with USO5 uh, at about 68 Fahrenheit. Again, that double pitch on that, one to two weeks is probably enough time for it, uh, just because it's gonna be struggling with that acidic environment, and it might take a bit longer than usual. At the end of the day, though, it should get to a nice final gravity. We'll add those raspberries in and hopefully get some nice flavor and some color out of that. So I'm really excited to see what comes of this beer, and I will catch you guys in a few weeks when it's all ready. So until then, cheers. Fermentation for the beer went really fast, actually. Um, I guess the two packets of yeast was still more than enough to combat the acidic environment. I saw myself hitting final gravity in about eight days. Once I saw that final gravity getting really close, I added my three pounds of raspberries, and I took these out of the freezer, let them thaw, and smashed them up with a sanitized potato masher, put them in a bowl, and then added them to a uh, hop bag because we wanted to minimize the amount of uh, gunky fruit material because that can clog up some dip tubes and stuff. So I left those in the beer for another three days or so and that allowed uh, additional fermentation to take place and turn the beer a really nice pink color. I think the raspberries potentially added about half a percent of alcohol to this whole thing, although I'm not really quite sure. So the beer is called Ich bin ein Berliner Weiss and it comes in at 3.6% ABV plus or minus and about four IBUs. For the color of the beer, it's pouring a really nice pinkish, orangish hue. Um, there's definitely some cloudiness to it. I think that'll probably go away eventually, but um, the way it is right now, it picks up light really, really nicely and just has this really vibrant color. Um, and then the head on the beer is a really nice, robust head and it's white for the most part, but I think it has a little bit of a pinkish hue to it, to be honest with you. Um, it's quite a nice looking beer. The aroma on this one is actually relatively light, one dimensional, I guess. It's got an aroma to it, but it's not really complicated. It's really just raspberries and some of that lactic sourness. But that's really it. No malt contribution, no hop contribution, obviously. So yeah, uh, let's move in for mouthfeel now. So the mouthfeel, really quite nice. Um, very, very highly carbonated. Again, this is the champagne of the north and you want to have that high level of carbonation, that dry finish, it's all there. Um, but there's also a nice little softness from the wheat. However, despite being three and a half percent, this is actually really not all that light overall. It's not thin, I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. It actually feels like a standard strength beer despite being so low in alcohol. It's very refreshing. Very much like a kind of a shandy character to it with the fruitiness, a little bit of acidity adding to the mouthfeel as well. But now let's go in for flavor because that's really where more of that acidity contribution is going to. Mm. <laughs> so with this flavor, the sourness level is aggressive. Not excessive, but aggressive. And that's because this finished at about 3.09 or so, um, which is, that's on paper pretty sour. Now, while my Goza that I made not too long ago finished at about the same range, this feels a lot more sour than the Goza does. There's a different characteristic to this acidity. It's much more of a mouth puckering kind of effect, and it feels a bit sharper. It feels a bit more, not harsh really, it's actually quite pleasant, um, but it feels, crisper in a way. It's really quite pleasant um, and definitely there's a layer of complexity in there that's not present from just using plain old lactic acid uh, via Philly Sour. 
So this is actually really quite nice. The acid character of the Philly Sour kind of was very short-lived. Um, this actually kind of lingers a little bit in the mouth. You get a little bit more of that kind of souring effect over time. And then the raspberries really blend into this in a really, really nice way. Um, the tartness of the raspberry, the natural berry tartness, blends into the lactic tartness. I definitely get a lot of raspberry flavor, but just in a really natural way. Doesn't feel fake. Obviously, I used berries, so it's, it's not going to taste fake at all because it's real. But um, they get a lot of that contribution, and obviously, a beautiful color came out of that. So the sour character is really nice. Raspberry character comes through really nicely. And that's really all there is to the flavor. It's actually quite simple. There's really not all that much else to talk about, to be honest. It's just a simple, refreshing, light, raspberry, wheat-based beer. It really does kind of check all those boxes and it nails the, a really nice summer beer. Uh, easy drinking, very refreshing, and uh, very satisfying. As far as potential improvements go, it's kind of hard to think of any because I don't have that many uh, experiences with sours, to be honest. Uh, this is only the uh, first kettle sour I've ever made, and um, to be honest, the first Berliner Weiss I've ever made. So this is kind of the baseline for me. I think what I'd like to see in the future maybe would be a little bit uh, additional hop character because it is a kettle souring process. I can add more hops and not destroy the sour character. So, um, so maybe in the future I could add some berry forward hops to the brew. That might not be a bad move, um, just to kind of push the raspberries a bit. Obviously you can play around with different fruits as well. Um, the raspberries alone are nice, but maybe blending in some blackberry or some mulberry or um, or huckleberry or something like that would be really nice uh, for this particular type of beer. The other thing too I want to talk about is the Philly Sour versus Kettle Sour kind of debate. Um, I really enjoy the flavor that the Kettle Sour uh, gives. It's a lot more uh, complex and interesting than the Philly Sour flavor is. Uh, you get a little bit more substantial depth to the sourness. The sourness level in this beer is about as far as I'd comfortably go with a kettle sour. It's it's pretty aggressive. Um, having two or three of these is going to give you uh, heartburn probably, so uh, I would keep that in mind if you're trying to control your own kettle souring process. The thing with the kettle souring process though is that you are not on your own time once you pitch that lacto in there. You're on the lacto's timeline. So when you're measuring the pH every 12 hours, you might find yourself needing to actually finish up the brew day like before work because your pH is hitting that very low level and you got to finish the brew day before it gets too sour. So in my case, it was done in 36 hours when I was expecting it to be done in 48 hours. And because of that, I actually ended up finishing the brew day in the morning, uh, which was not my plan. <laughs> it was the lactose plan though. So uh, keeping that in mind, if you're gonna do a kettle sour, yes, it does make your individual brew days a little shorter because you're splitting it up halfway through, but it also means that you're gonna have to block out some time, uh, potentially on one of those days, to finish the brew day. Otherwise, you risk getting it too sour. Otherwise, though, I did enjoy the process, and yeah, I would do it again. It's, uh, it's a really nice way to add a nice level of complexity to a beer, although I don't think I'd let it get down to 3.09 again. <laughs> Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoy the video. Let me know what your thoughts are on kettle souring versus Philly sour versus traditional long-term souring. What's your experience like? Have you brewed beers like this? And what do you think I should do next with the souring uh, journey? And if you enjoyed the video, please go ahead, hit that like button before you leave, comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because I am super close to 30,000 subscribers, which is a huge milestone for me. Uh, I've been in this for a while, 30,000 is a big number for the brewing YouTube game. So I really appreciate it if you do subscribe. Half of you guys aren't, so it doesn't hurt you. Please go ahead and do it. If you want to support the channel, there's a number of different ways to do so, but I do recommend picking up a t-shirt like this one down in the merchandise store. You can find that in the description box or down below the description box. Sometimes it'll show up. I also have um, the Patreon. My Patreon supporters are really a huge help in terms of upgrading the production quality for the channel and just making it a better place. So you have my utmost thanks. There's also channel memberships and the super thanks button if you feel inclined to check out either of those options as well. And last but certainly not least, there's also an Amazon store in the description box where I have all of my brewing equipment that I highly recommend, all of my filming equipment, all that stuff. So if you're curious, please do check that out as well. 
if you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook. So check those links out. That's at the apartment brewer on either platform uh, for some more frequent content updates and you get to see what's going to come to the channel in the future. So it's definitely worth checking out. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me because I put a lot of work into these things and I hope you're getting a lot out of them as well. So if you're still here, thanks. And this one goes out to you guys. So until the next one, cheers. Ooh, sour beer chugging is kind of hard.